of the rich story. The diameter of an atomic nucleus measures about a billionth of a millimeter. Delving into the structure of matter, scientists work with particles they can never see, acting in ways they can scarcely even imagine. People think the science is just sort of skeptical all the time and, and questions everything. Now, in fact, you wouldn't get anywhere in science if you were questioning everything. Uh, you have to have some basis of belief. You have to commit yourself that the world is likely to be this way and then go on to find out whether it, whether it is. Now, you may have to correct that belief. You may find that what you first thought wasn't quite right. But if you were simply skeptical, you would never make any progress at all. So in an interesting way, science requires commitment, faith, belief to a particular point of view, which you then measure against experience and perhaps adjust in the light of experience. Now, actually, I think religion is exactly the same. Religion doesn't involve shutting your eyes and gritting your teeth and believing the impossible. It means that you learn from the scriptures and from the experience of the church uh, what God is like and how he has made himself known, particularly in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then you measure that against your experience. So I think in that sense, science and, and religion are not so different. In fact, I think they're cousins under the skin. Our sun has had a profound influence on our planet over its 4.6 billion year history. Our world was a violent, noxious place of poison oceans and lightning storms. Under the benign rays of the sun, it was mysteriously transformed after 4 billion years into a world inhabited by complex reproducing organic molecules we call life. The universe is 15 billion years old, and we've been around for just a few hundred thousand years at the most. Uh, we emerge, however, as something entirely new in the history of the universe. We obviously arose from primitive ancestors. Um, we arose from the animal world. But we have qualities that the animal world doesn't have. We are self-conscious, we know about ourselves, and I want to say also we are worshipping beings, we know about God. So we represent something really new in the history of the universe. I think that our self-consciousness, that we're aware not only of what's happening, but that we can reflect upon that, that not only that we die, but that we know we're going to die, which I think animals don't know, that is one of the things that makes us different. Wonderful and all, as is the universe disclosed by the mighty telescopes, the most complicated creation of all is six inches behind the eyepiece. One of the most surprising things is that how rapidly the human brain grew. The human brain is immensely complicated. It's the most elaborate physical system we, we've ever encountered in our exploration of the universe. And it evolved very, very quickly in, in just a few hundred thousand years, which may sound a long time, but in terms of the history of evolution, this is just uh, a few minutes, really. And that's very striking. I don't think we understand, really, how that evolution came about quite so quickly. It's a bit of a puzzle, really. It is, of course, possible to imagine any number of other kinds of universe where the different controlling forces, like gravity or electromagnetism, might be stronger or weaker than in our own. When we think how special the universe is, that seems to demand an explanation. And I think there are really two ways of explaining it. You could either say, well, perhaps there are lots of different universes, uh, and we just happen to live in the one that happens to be just right to produce humankind. That would be one explanation. Now. That's a guess, but it's not a scientific guess, because scientifically we only have reason to know about the universe that we can explore and which we inhabit. And I think it's a much better guess myself that there is in fact only one universe, but which is the way it is, and it's very delicate and fruitful balance, because it is not any old world, but it is a creation which God has endowed with just those properties that will make it fruitful. Both science and the Bible seem to agree that our world will have an apocalyptic end. But the destiny of the human race transcends questions of physical life and death. Moral issues are involved, whether good will triumph or evil. I think that the problem of evil is the most difficult problem uh, for belief. It keeps more people back from belief, I think, than anything else, and it's the greatest worry for those of us who are believers. I think that the key to understanding it, really, is that God is not a sort of puppet master who pulls every string and makes everything happen according to his will. 
Nor is he, of course, indifferent, just letting things happen and take their course. He interacts with the world, but he has given to his creation a freedom to be itself. So he allows us to make our choices and sometimes to do terrible things, and he allows, if you like, the whole universe to do its thing as well. When an earthquake takes place, it's not God's will that lots of people should be killed, but he allows the earth's rocks to behave in a way that's natural for them. So I believe that God neither wills the act of a murderer nor the incidence of a cancer, but he allows both to happen in a world to which he's given its own true freedom. In recent times, new technologies have vastly increased the store of human knowledge. Yet science as we know it is no older than a few mere ticks of the clock that measures cosmic time. People sometimes think that in the scientific age, reason has got to be reasonable. Now, if that means it's got to have uh, mo motivation, of course, I entirely agree with that. But if it means it's simply got to be reduced to common sense, what anyone uh, can accept just straight away, I'm not persuaded by that at all. Science isn't like that. Science is full of surprises. The most odd things happen. The quantum world is entirely different from the everyday world. But it has its own rich structure and understanding. And it seems to me that, actually, Christian theology is like that, too. In terms of everyday experience, how can God be three persons and yet one God? But there is, I think, something satisfying and profound in the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. And it arises, of course, from human experience, that we know God as God above us, God our Father, God made known in human terms in Jesus Christ, God alongside us, and God at work in our lives, the Holy Spirit within us. So the doctrine of the Trinity is both exciting and also based on experience. Religion and science have not always had an easy relationship. Galileo taught that the earth moved around the sun and not vice versa as the Bible seemed to teach. In 1633, the Holy Inquisition forced him to retract this supposed heresy. Eventually, the Vatican did apologize for condemning him 337 years after his death. This is a sort of popular picture that, that somehow rather science and religion are at each other's throats. But in fact, if you look at the history of science, that doesn't say at all. Uh, science in its modern form started in Western Europe in the, in the 16th, 17th centuries. And the people who got it going were mostly people, religious people. Most of the first fellows of the Royal Society were uh, Puritans. Uh, Galileo was a religious man, though he had his problems with the church, of course. Newton was also a deeply religious man, uh, though he was perhaps a little unorthodox in some ways. And people were motivated uh, to look at the physical world because they thought it was God's creation and worth studying. And in fact, that connection between science and religion has persisted. For example, here in Cambridge in the 19th century, we had some very, very great people, Maxwell and Calvin and people like that, who are also deeply religious. So the sort of picture, that somehow or other, you have to be either a scientist or a religious believer, it's just not true. In fact, I'm both myself. John Pokinghorn has had an unusual career. Professor of theoretical physics, curate in Bristol, vicar in Kent, dean of Trinity Hall, and finally, elected by his fellow academics to the prestigious post of president of Queen's College, Cambridge. It's a career based on two loves, the love of science and the love of God.